Please note that this video has spoilers for the subject. Put off by how long this video is. Don't worry, I try to jam pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. Scream 3 Movie Thoughts I find the opening scene somewhat mixed. On the one hand, it... I'll get into the whole thing with the, the, the voice changer on, you know, the voice modulator. And, you know, it starts in the shower. It, it literally, the, the opening scene is the kind of thing that the stab movie in Scream 2 was making fun of. You know, the, the opening of Scream 2 said, you know, you know how you could make the opening of the first movie even more cliche and, and dumb? How about, excuse me, the character, you know, was just taking a shower. And in this, they literally, you know, without a trace of irony, that is what's going on. And when once both characters are in the same place, you know, it's, you know, she thinks that he's the one running around trying to kill him, you know, and then, you know, she's, yeah, you know, the, the killer's right behind her, and then he's like, no, behind you, and it doesn't really go well, and yeah, it just, it definitely has its problems. I will admit that there are parts of it that, that very nicely, you know, fit with the first one, and that, you know, being the last part of a trilogy, this should go back to the first one. And so we are actually, we start out with a conversation on the phone where, you know, one of the people doesn't really know the other, but gets flirty with them, you know, and Cotton actually does give up his name, which Casey didn't. You know, Casey kept, you know, ducking that one. And, you know, the there's talk of the, you know, the romantic partner, you know, in, yeah, boyfriend to girlfriend here, and, you know, there, there are questions asked, and when the killer isn't satisfied with the answer, they end up killing, you know, they, they kill both people in the opening scene. And the, you know, and there's the mention of, you know, I, I must have gotten a wrong number, and you know, yeah, there's there's a lot of, of good there, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a good, the, also, you know, with the, with the boyfriend-girlfriend thing, you know, in the first one, it's like, you know, maybe, you know, Casey's, yeah, like, do you have a boyfriend? Maybe, do you want to ask me on a date, or something like that, I don't remember the exact lines, and, then it turns out she does have one. In in this one, you know, the killer already knows that there's, you know, and it's again, you know, the moment that there, that the the, you know, romantic partner is brought up. There's that threat of I'm going to hurt them and you can't stop me, and yeah, the. <clears throat> And it does, you know, I've already mentioned there's the thing of the, the voice modulator, so that's why we don't recognize the voice, why we don't know that it's Ghostface. But, yeah, I mean, when you don't know that they're, they're doing that with the voice modulator in this one, then you do actually have this, yeah, you know, you don't necessarily know right away that that's the killer you know, or, yeah, if, if you don't know going in that there's that kind of voice modulator, you figure that that can't be the killer, or that, you know, failing that, I guess, that the voice is the killer's actual voice, or, yeah, 
but yeah, it's there. There are definitely some some interesting things there, and the and to get back to the the kind of problems, you know, we when we see it, we do figure that at least one of these people is going to end up dead. That's you know, again, when you watch the first movie, especially because it's Drew Barrymore and she did all this press and such. And she's right there on the cover next to, you know, the actual protagonists. Yeah, it's like where, you know, they, they couldn't possibly actually kill her. And then the second one, they're not necessarily in a safe place, you know. But, you know, this theater, it's they're surrounded by people. How could the killer possibly get in, kill someone, and get back out without being stopped? You know, you, you really don't think that they will be and then you know it's also this you know we we have the the first movie playing out in front and then you know the second movie as well it's it's a really great kind of yeah there's just it's interesting it's and in this it just at the end of the day it's pretty generic you know the you know that, yeah, the, the, you know, basically the killer calls Cotton to get, to find out where Sydney is. And, you know, that brings her into, that's why she, you know, because really if, if they didn't mention her early on, you wouldn't really think that she mattered. You know, that and the Maureen you know, photos. Other than that, you don't connect them where, you know, I mean, sure, stab three and there's a new, you know, actor playing Sydney in it, but yeah, you know, where in the first one, that's someone that, you know, the first two kills are people that Sydney goes to high school with, you know, and in the second one, the first two killed are people you know, who attend the same college, and then you also have the thing of the names matching. In this, you know, anyway, I, I will get more into that aspect. Basically, the, yeah, it boils down to, you know, the killer attacks these two people in their home and kills them both. That's, that's it, you know, it's, yeah. It, it doesn't particularly subvert expectations and the thing with how you know suddenly Christine doesn't think that you know she thinks that that was cotton in the mask because of the voice modulator <sighs> yeah it, that's just trying too hard anyway it does of course overall play you know some with expectations and at least supposed to do so you know, with it being now a trilogy, with it being, you know, the final of Slasher Sheet, well, which it was maybe supposed to be at the time, but yeah, you know, being a sequel to the, the first one, you know, will the character types that lived, that survived the other films survive, will the character types that died, die, and yeah, and with it being a trilogy it goes back to the beginning and that's one of my problems with this I I don't really mind too much the idea you know Roman's actual motivation and like I said in the review I I like a lot of what's in the the climax of what's in the end and I mean, I, I may elaborate on this, but just briefly, you know, he takes hostages the way that, you know, the killer does in the, you know, in the opening of the first one. And, you know, again, you have this, you know, he's giving orders and the, suppose, you know, the possible victim, Sydney, is following those orders, again, like the opening of the first one. And you know, the, 
and and you have the the characters you know properly fighting back and just I'll be honest I don't I don't love the climax of the second one and it's not just the you know yeah I I it's it's you know both the second and this one are convoluted in setting up how the the climax comes to be you know getting the characters in the into the place that they you know that they that the script you know needs them to but i just if if it's going to be that yeah, I love the climax of the first one. I love that, you know, these couple of characters in this house and, you know, it's like, well, which one is it? And then you find out who it is and then you have characters that you thought were dead coming back or that you at least thought wouldn't be coming back, coming back. And, yeah, and this one does that, you know, the, yeah, I, if, if it's going to be either very similar to the first or it's going to be as different as the one in the second is then I like this, you know and I'm not going to be I won't be spoiling the fourth in this one you know I I did already do videos on that back when it came out and I don't have a copy it is not impossible that I will at some point down the line but yeah I I not it's not currently part of my plan and yeah, it's so so yeah, so I won't be commenting on how that one relates and how the climax is there, but yeah, you know, as far as these two sequels go, if you gotta be as different as the second is or as similar to the first one as this is, then I definitely prefer this you know, I'm and I'm not saying that the second one should necessarily I think if the if the second one had had it then this one wouldn't have the such a similar climax and it's again the trilogy thing so you know yeah I'm I'm fine with the second one having the climax it does as long as we also get this and yeah now I feel like the this one makes the whole thing with Maureen too Actually, yeah, there are things I should go into first. You know, other than going back to the beginning, you know, or yeah, as part of going back to the beginning, this elaborates on the first one with Roman being the one who sent Billy, you know, who who gave Billy his motivation and who gave the two some tips. You know, he's a director, he directs. So, you know, he gave them a list of horror films to watch for inspiration or, yeah. And it's, again, it's about, you know, someone getting revenge because of what was done to their family or what was done to them. The Prescott family and the Loomis family are connected. And the, you know, Maureen's, you know... Maureen expressing her sexuality and having, you know, non-marital, not premarital, but non-marital sex leads to, you know, murder in, you know, starting out with her own. And, you know, before it was because of the man she had sex with. And in this, it's then because of the, the child that she had as a product of, you know, having sex. And, yeah, I, I like a lot, you know, the, the second one does some of that as well. And, you know, I, I don't like what the second one does with it. But in this, it really, you know, it's very decidedly, like, it, you know, it goes back to before the first one and, you know, changes what we thought we knew about the first one. And, you know, and it... It works, you know, in the first one, they don't say how he knew that Maureen was having sex with his father, you know, or how, you know, how it was discovered or, you know, whatever it, you know, 
but it makes sense that, you know, Billy Loomis's mother leaves him, and, you know, or it could be before, but, yeah, you know, and, you know, maybe after, maybe before, he sees the video that Roman even shows Sydney there at the end of, you know, and that's, yeah, that, that is Hank, that is the actor from, who played, you know, Billy's father in the first one, so, yeah, it's, you know, I, I recognize him as, you know, re-watching, and I, you know, I studied the, the credits before watching, so I'd know who to look out for and such, and, yeah, it, you know, in the first one, they don't say how they knew, and in this, we find out how, yeah. Overall, I do think that it does become, you know, it's it's a bit too elaborate. Like, you know, like I said in the review, it's convoluted, and it's, you know, Maureen's past becomes too important and too connected to other things. I, you know, something that they do in you know, in these slashers where they expand on, you know, for example, in a trilogy or in the part of, in, in the sequel called Final, you know, the final part of the series, you know, what they'll do and what they, of course, couldn't do here is go and elaborate on the, you know, the killer because in a lot of these slasher series, it's that the killer keeps coming back. In this, it's that every new killer, you know, takes on the the ghost face, you know, but it's it's not the same character. You know, so in these first three, each time it's connected to Maureen Prescott and her having sex with, you know, others than. Sydney's father, but you know, yeah. So, so in this, it becomes that they elaborate a lot on the original victim, and yeah, that's just it's not as interesting as finding out why this killer keeps coming back, or you know, what horrible thing is in their past that has been driving them all this time, or something, you know, and that's, I mean, they, they did have, they had to go somewhere with this one, and again, the, you know, the fourth one, like I said in the review, in the fourth one, they go and tackle it as a reboot, and that's immensely clever, and they do great satirizing of reboots. But with this, I mean, they already they they did the original, they did the the sequel. Yeah, you kind of do have to go for you know trilogy or final part of kind of thing, and yeah, they just they didn't have, and I do think they did a good job of making you know putting this killer chronologically before Billy and Stu, but yeah. It's they. I do think they did the best they could, and you know it's probably better than if they hadn't gone in that direction at all. Because you know that is again at least interesting. And you know, like the other films, it breaks the rules. And again, the motivation is in part revenge, but it's, you know, there's maybe also something else there. Now, when Ghostface calls, he can now modulate his voice to sound like the main characters rather than, you know, so, so we, we, excuse me, we're, we're watching a scene where a character on screen is talking to a main character when we're not seeing that main character and the voice suddenly becomes Ghostface's voice or they the character you know or they say something that reveals them to be Ghostface you know and yeah and it turned out to be Ghostface all along it's kind of like a 
you know, a dream sequence kind of thing, you know, but all along it was, you know, and it's just, it's really cheap. And I don't know, I guess the idea is that Roman recorded their their voice and like put it in software and like extrapolated and now he has a modulator that can have them say anything and I, I don't know I guess maybe he put in all that effort and time you know I mean he's got Dewey's voice which I guess you know he's an advisor on the film so maybe he kept calling him Maybe it's different people, otherwise wouldn't it eventually seem odd that he keeps calling him? Because, I mean, could he really get a good recording if he wasn't calling him? If he was, like, just talking face-to-face? -face? You know, you need a, a good microphone, maybe a good room for... You know, the, the reason that, like, reporters do that with a hidden microphone is because that's the only way to, you know, maybe get the, the details that they, they need. The sound doesn't necessarily turn out that well on that, especially back then in the, you know, late 90s. You know, I mean, today, I, you know, you could, you know, I, I could totally imagine that, you know, voice modulators of, of this sort, I, I don't know of, I don't know whether or not they do, but I could imagine that they basically do. And again, you know, as long as you've recorded that care that person saying enough things and you know using those like in in Mission Impossible 3 when they're you know when they're doing the microphone for like one of the, the face masks the character actually has the the character whose face they're you know have him say something that uses all the different you know, all the different vowels and all the different, like, you know, yeah, so that they, but anyway, but then, you know, he also has Sydney's voice, and I mean, has he been calling, again, like using different voices, the, the, the hotline, and managing to get her, like, the one time he calls her, and we know, you know, and you see it's not the, off, it's the home line. So, you know, but that was when he found her, wasn't it? I mean, if he had found her before then, if it was supposedly just about her, I, I don't know. It just seems, I mean, if you're calling a hotline, you're not, you know, you're getting someone you're not get you know you can't call them and necessarily get the the person you most want to talk to you know so yeah but you know i guess that's how it's supposed to be explained but then they don't even use it in, a, in an interesting way they they use it with Sid for you know luring them to the party but you can tell that there's i don't know i mean i guess you won't necessarily be able to tell that that's not her the first time you hear it. You know, we'll just say, well, okay, we're not seeing her, but we don't have to see her for that. You know, but just what what she says sounds suspicious, and she won't really talk to Dewey. She just quickly says it, and then, you know, that's it. It's, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe we don't necessarily piece it together right and you know and then yeah and then when they arrive it's like well I wouldn't you know invite Sydney and then yeah so it's it's not I mean if the if the characters in the movie weren't being kind of stupid there then it wouldn't have worked then you know the yeah like I already mentioned you know in, in both the second and this it's con it's it's contrived how they managed to get all the characters that they need into the you know small little area that yeah but the yeah I mean when when someone you know gives a very short message like that and then hangs up on you 
you might call them and say, are you okay? Because you sound a little off. And if he had done that, then it, then the, what the killer did wouldn't have worked. You know, then they could have gone to the police station, met Sydney, because the, the only reason that, you know, Sydney leaves the police station without Martin by her side, with, you know, without the, pop, the, the cops in general, is because Dewey fell for it. Dewey went to the house and then Roman got them. So, yeah, you know, yeah, so they do that with it, and, you know, there's that thing where you think that the, the bodyguard is talking to Dewey, and then it turns out to have been, you know, Roman, and he kills him, you know, a call, but it isn't interesting, is when, you know, Roman kills Jay McCarthy, and then there's that opening, which, you know, yeah, you know, it, 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 it has the effect of making her hesitate, you know, first, you know, it's, I was just trying to bring the game to the next level, and then when Cotton actually shows up afterwards, because she's heard the voice, you know, and, she, yeah, it just, but that again, that just, it feels cheap. It's this, you know, it's because there's only so many ways that you can get two characters close to each other and kill them one by one without, you know, I mean, at, at some point, don't they, you know, don't they take other actions or don't they, you know, figure out that something's going, you know, something, but yeah. And the reason why Ghostface calling you works is because, you know, a call, I mean, talking of, you know, I'm speaking of when, back when not everybody had a cell phone and you know, when, and it weren't online all the time, so when someone calls someone else, you know, it's, it's an intimate situation. The focus is completely on that other person, and yet you can't see them, you can't make eye contact, you can't read body language, you don't even know their physical reality, you don't know where they are, what they're wearing, the overall situation that they're in, you know, like, you know, he realizes that she's making, you know, in the first one, he realizes that she's making popcorn because he hears it, and we know because we see it, but if he hadn't heard it, he would have no idea, you know, the, it's a tiny little window into the other person's world, and the, the, you know, even if, if, if it's someone you don't know yet, or if it's someone you haven't seen in a while, you don't even necessarily know what they look like. You know, you can end the conversation at any moment without walking away. You can even prevent them from calling back. So, you know, it's safer than a an in-person first meeting, especially if it's in a place you don't already know. And that is what we're talking about, a, a you know, you don't yet know too much about what's going on when you're just on the phone with someone that you don't net yet know. So, you know, the, the moment that you realize that the caller's actually watching you, which, and you know, is another intimate situation, but a one-sided one, a scary one, and one that where the victim is completely out of control, that's terrifying, and when you then go, f you know, when, yeah, when, when it goes from someone whose voice we know talking to a character we're seeing to Ghostface, it's basically the film acting in bad faith, and it's, again, you know, I, I get it, you have to keep you know, they have to find a way to make Ghostface be able to call these people. You know, that's also some, I, 
I love the second one, but there's very little ghost fit. You know, we get a little with the CC, but that's, you know, yeah, there's, there's very little. And that is one of the, yeah, it's, again, like, like I said, with, you know, how they have to flesh out more in Prescott's past because they don't have a set killer. They just have new killers that wear the same costume and use the same weapon. It's, you know, you can't have the, the character doing what we really want them to do too much without it no longer, you know, working. You know, in a lot of slashers, it you know, maybe it's no longer scary. In this, it's genuinely the moment that you hear the voice of Ghostface calling someone, you know, it works. It's such a perfect... Yeah, it's it's just about perfect in the first move, that opening scene, because when you first hear the voice, you know, I mean, I guess if you've, like, I don't remember if it's in the trailers or whatever, but if you don't know, then when you just watch that first scene, before it becomes threatening, it doesn't, you know, it, it just sounds like a normal, you know, it's... If it wasn't on the phone, it might just be that, you know, two people are, like, standing in line together or something like that, where, you know, yeah, you just, you, you, you meet and you have a conversation. You don't yet know the other person, but, you know, that's what that first conversation is all about. And then once once it does turn tense then the the you know then he starts toying with her tormenting her and it's this thing of you know again with with a slasher typically it is you know he's following them or stalking them or the like but he doesn't usually directly communicate to them and like you know he's playing a game he's playing trivia movie trivia and you know at the same time he's you know and and he's telling her come on follow the horror movie rules whilst threatening to, you know i want to see what your insides look like and you know he he you know cuts open Steve's stomach, you know, and this, it's, yeah, it, and obviously we want more of that, but, you know, it's just the, the moment that, that the, you know, Ghostface calls another person, then why doesn't that person just call the police, you know, hang up, you know, hang up, star 69, that sucker, and call the police is, a, I believe, what Jada Pinkett Smith, you know, suggests. And, yeah, so you, you know, and in both of these, they, they do find some ways to, to do that. But, and, yeah, again, I, I do think that they do some interesting ones in this, especially near the, the very end with, you know, Roman... You know he's got the vic he's he's got the the hostages that he's also using. You know that was also part of it with you know do as I say or Steve gets it. And you know yeah, giving directions and the whole yeah. In general, I I quite like Roman. I think he's I. Yeah, I, I just I I like both the I like the acting on both sides of him, you know, turning out to be the the killer and the yeah, just in in general, I I feel like it it works. And you know, I I did think that it was you know. It was a decent element that sometimes they're stalked even while in the group, you know, when they're inside the house. He's still, you know, he's sending the message to all of them in a fax machine. Remember fax machines? And, you know, and then he uses an explosion to kill. 
that really doesn't fit. I I think the second one goes as far, pretty much, you know, in elaborate and creative kills as it could. And in this, it yeah, I get why they're going further. You know, it's a sequel, but yeah, it just but but it it doesn't fit, and it wouldn't even if it wasn't the most ridiculous OTT explosion in movie history, but just in general, the, the movie feels, you know, OTT for a slasher, and in general, not not always that much like a slasher. The killer is too powerful, and, you know, the supernatural dream sequence it's creepy, but it really doesn't fit. I. It felt more like Nightmare on Elm Street than Scream. And, you know, we do, of course, have some great Dewey and Gale stuff. You know, they're, they're always sweet together and, you know, well... I... Yeah, they, they, they can be really you know, cute together, and, yeah, the the way that it's, you know, like, you know, they've now both left Woodsboro, and, you know, she's been replaced with the, the, you know, the, the one who plays her, you know, she's, she's not a real Gale Weathers, but she plays one on TV, I do think that, you know, they've made these strong female character, you know, Sydney less so, but, you know, Gail has lost a lot of this strong independent woman kind of thing with, you know, she's too dependent on Gail, on Dewey, and, you know, the other, you know, Parker Posey's character is just too cartoony, and, you know, again, I'm not saying that you can't have, you know, not, not every female character has to be a strong female character, but it is, it really sticks out like a sore thumb to have made one of the major strong female characters much less independent, and, you know, when the main independent, when, yeah, the main strong female character is so much, you know, it is in the film so much less, and, yeah, you don't really have you know, the, the stat three Sid isn't like, you know, she's not necessarily like weak, but she's, she's not strong and she's definitely not very interesting when, yeah, this, you know, the first two, they're really interesting, you know, yeah, Sydney, Gail and Sydney's best friend character in each of them strong, female character, you know, they don't, they're not always like, you know, I mean, some are going to say that Hallie is, you know, for wanting to be part of a sorority is, you know, but at the same time, she's not, that's not her only, the only thing she's got going on. She's also telling Sydney, which is correct, you have to try to put this behind you. You know, she says this before the, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure she says this before the new killer shows up, because at that point it's kind of, take care of this killer, then move on. And of course in this one it's also just, you know, Sydney, you know, has to try to move on, with, you know, her father s tells her that, so they haven't thought of a new conflict for her since the second one. But, yeah, you know, the and, you know, some are going to fault Tatum for being with Stu, but they are, you know, strong, they, you know, they have their opinions, they stand by them, and they don't just, you know, they, they, you know, they try to protect Sydney, and they, you know, their actions tend to make sense, and again, means, you know, Tatum, when, you know, in, in the garage, but again, the moment that she sees a knife, she believes it, and, I mean, 
she's a single door away from a dozen high schoolers. You know, she she thinks it's one of them pulling a prank. She thinks it's Stu, if I recall. And she thinks, you know, she should be safe. You know, they're right in there. They, you know, if if they realize that there's a killer there, I mean, yeah, they can just rush him and that's it. You know, so anyway, the I I'm not sure if I've said all I wanted on the ending. I'm really glad they did the reshoots because from reading it, man, the ending would have been lame before the reshoots. But yeah, I like that it's the yeah the the you know Roman, and I feel like it's if we if we're comparing, I feel like. In the second one, Mrs. Loomis. Like I say in the thoughts video for that, why didn't Sydney recognize Mrs. Loomis? If you know, I mean, or yeah, how she recognized her at the moment that she sees her with a gun in her hand, you know, and and behind Gail. So does that mean she would have recognized her if she'd seen her in other? You know, Mrs. Loomis was right there whenever her story broke. You know, she was like first on the scene. So does that mean that if Sydney had seen her before, it would have? And in this, it makes sense. Sydney had no idea that she had a half brother. So yeah, and Roman never tried to contact her directly. He only contacted Maureen, and you know, I mean, even the first one, we know that Maureen can keep a secret when it comes to, or you know, that she doesn't. That, that Sydney isn't a big, you know, doesn't really want to accept what her, that her mother had sex with other, you know, yeah, that, you know, other, you know, with people she wasn't in a committed relationship with. And, yeah, I, I can totally believe that, you know, I mean, even if there was some indication, even if she, like, you know, if her mother was, like, you know, trying not to cry right after, you know, turning him away and Sydney saw it, that Maureen could probably get her to believe that it had nothing to do with her, you know, yeah, with her having sex with someone she wasn't in a long-term relationship with because Sydney wanted to believe that her mother was a saint, as it were. I quite like Randy's cameo. I, yeah, the, the killing him off in the second one was awful, and I'm really glad that they did at least, you know, it was... They actually considered bringing him, saying that he was, you know, they they hid him while the the killer did the, you know, he was pretty, for sure dead in the. I mean, even with what Dewey survived in, you know, yeah, Randy was dead at the end of that scene for sure. But yeah, the you know the him talking to. You know, I said Dewey, I think, and you know, because he knew what say, you know, yeah, that's kind of funny. And yeah, Jamie Kennedy is great in these, and you know, I, I quite like Heather Matarazzo, you know, great actress, and I really like that, you know, she, you know, the, the police, like, you know, they do the jump scare, and she's like to the police, I'm only 17, don't shoot me, Heather. You're not black, you don't, you know. And the, you know, the, the the sets from the first film, you know, the that whole scene is well acted and it is genuinely scary and clever, 
but it is also incredibly clear that the you know these sets were made purely to have that scene in the movie you know when they were made Wes Craven didn't even know what what he would film there he just knew that he wanted to film something there and I get you know Stab 3 returned to Woodsboro so the film Stab 3 was always going to have some Woodsboro stuff right there in Sydney's home and in the the high school you know bathroom and I do you know yeah, the thing with, oh, that's actually Stab 3, Sid. It's not the killer trying to hide in there, you know. And, yeah, you know, but it's just the, the, it's clear that the film needs to basically recreate parts of the first one rather than just mixing things up the way they do in 2 and 4. You know, they, they have tons of references to the first film as well, but they do something different with it. They don't just... You know, and yeah, I I will admit I I do really like seeing Sydney. You know, close the door. Then he's in the closet. Then she runs up the the stairs, and you know she, you've got the thing with she blocks the door the same way she did, and you know you've got Billy. You know, in the first one it was Billy the killer before we knew he was the killer coming through the window. In this, it's Ghostface who comes through the window in Ghostface costume and attacks and Sid jumps out of a window in order to get you know to, to yeah or I don't know I guess she I'm not entirely certain that that was planned exactly as it but yeah it is it is very you know intense and exciting for sure and I, I really love that Yet again, she provokes Ghostface. She doesn't just, you know, I mean, he's he's got her. He's right there about to kill her. And she's still, like, you know, saying what she, you know, what she means and not letting, you know, not being scared to the point of not doing something. You know, again, that's that's right there in the first one in her introduction. You know, like, there's someone on the phone saying... I'm right outside your door and I'm going to kill you and she says I don't believe you and she goes out there and you know and even after having been chased you know they're at the end of the both the first and the second and then again this yeah she's she's provoking him and she's not just like she's being smart about it she's not just provoking but yeah but yeah, near the end, you know, characters get separated, knocked out, or the like, really awkwardly and obviously to, you know, for, you know, in part to, to kill off all these characters and to make sure that the, the only characters left are the ones that, you know, the, the survivors and then Martin. I don't personally have a problem with... Roman's body being found and then he turns out not to have been dead. I didn't see her check a pulse and I mean, you know, we, we saw earlier in the film, you know, what was it, Ricky, the, the Randy homage with a pair of scissors through his throat, you know, the, the film, you know, Scream 3 exists in a world where, you know, very convincing makeup effects exist and are commonplace so yeah he had a you know he had someone make him a body you know that looked just like him and and you know fake his death you know i mean heck he probably got stan i love that you know that probably is supposed to you know you know hint at stan winston you know he probably did get stan to Make, you know, just with the words, I really want to scare the, you know, the next time I cast a, you know, the, the protagonist in a, maybe that's what he said for Stab 3. To, to cast Sidney Prescott, I want a lifelike, you know, so that when I invite them in for, for the meeting, they find the body. Can you do that for me? You can do that for me. Great. You know, that totally, you know, so, and it you know it's it's like how billy was killed in front of us in front of sid 
in the first one and then comes back. You know, it's, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I thought that worked quite nicely. There only being one ghost face, not two, really does make the, you know, yeah, the, the stuff he can do just unbelievable. You know, I already mentioned him, suddenly he's in the closet from, you know, she, she locks the door and goes in, suddenly he's in the closet. And, you know, the, yeah, the various teleporting, you know, suddenly he's by the car, and suddenly he's completely gone from there, you know, when, yeah, he rolls under the car and the whole, yeah. And I do like that, you know, Sid uses an ice pick, much like, you know, Tatum said that, you know, you know, there, there are female killers, thing, you know, Sharon Stone and, you know, Basic Instinct. That was an ice pick. So in this, you know, the woman trying to kill someone uses an ice pick. And I, I really love how she turns the tables on Ghostface, which I really missed in the second one. You know, she calls him, she hides from him, she attacks from a hiding space spot. Now, the... I, I thought that the idea of the the people being killed, the, the order they are killed in the actual, you know, in Stat 3 was, you know, an interesting enough idea. And, you know, unfortunately, much like the, the copycat killer thing in Scream 2, it didn't really go anywhere. I, mean, I don't know, they, they just did not seem to be able to go anywhere with that. You know, and in the first one, it's just, you know, these, you know, Teenagers are being killed by this, you know, you, you didn't necessarily need to, you know, it was just these various high school students were being, you know, called up and then killed. And I do think that, you know, noteworthy in when we're talking about like horror, you know, slasher trilogies or maybe more that slasher series when there is a chapter called the final one you know the 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 person who survived you know some of the films including the you know and and killed the slasher killer becomes the new slasher killer and much, you know, and in this, it's, you know, that's what Roman wants the world to believe, you know, so he's framing her, and it, of course, also fits nicely with, you know, in the first one, they were trying to frame her father, and, you know, and actually, she, and yeah, and in the second one, there was a frame job that just wasn't of a Prescott, but it was of Mickey, which, you know, wasn't that much of a frame job, really, but, yeah. And, just like in the other slashers where this happens, it doesn't stick. And in, you know, in the, the film after it, the, the, you know, the person who was supposed to become the killer is just one of the survivors and maybe tries to kill the, the slasher again, the like. You know, I should note not the the survivor doesn't always manage to kill the slasher, but you know certainly tries to fight them and survives attacks by them. But yeah, and in this case, it not sticking is of course in part because you know it was a frame job and that you know she survived and the actual killer dies. I I quite like Roman's you know manic shouting near the end. You know. It, shut up, don't want to hear it, and the, and then when he actually comes at them, and he, you know, do keep shooting him in the chest, you can't kill me, you can't kill me, you know, yeah, now, when, you know, they, they note that Maureen, when she was younger, you know, had sex with 
a bunch of guys in Hollywood to try to get parts and then she accused them of, of rape and you know it is then you know then after she leaves Hollywood and she starts a normal life she you know she continues to have sex with you know several men and you know outside of you know being in a relationship and having sex with some who are in a relationship and you know this is something that is you know it's it's not a very comfortable realization but that does sometimes happen with someone who's been raped or pushed into it you know pressured into sex or the like if they you know because there there gets to be this idea that then becomes like internalized of the only way I can be worth something is if I have sex with someone who has power at least some power and it's the only way I can attain power myself and that does make sense here that you know she she was supposed to be having sex with these powerful men in Hollywood and back then she you know then you know it's not clear we only really have like Milton's word on it but we don't we don't know for sure if she was raped or if she regretted having sex afterwards and it's you know do note that actual you know false rape allegations are extremely rare and you know almost whenever a woman says she's been raped she has been and we need to take that more seriously because it's that it's it's far too rare that it gets prosecuted properly and that the rapist is actually punished so we don't know in the film if she was raped or if she just regretted afterwards but in either case it can lead to you know she you know she was having sex so she would get better roles and then once she started a normal life you know it's maybe financial security that she was hoping for that and yeah that is some you know it unfortunately that has been the one way that women could get power in a lot of history is by sleeping with you know the the man who has the most power that they can you know that that they can seduce or who you know has sex with them whether they want it or not which is you know part of why there there's this you know stereotype of women stealing men from each other I've read other parts of this franchise the links are in the description box please comment thumbs up and subscribe for more content